so let's get Thanks. started uh, while the other participants join in. Uh, my name is Varun Malik. Uh, I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is new age in the sense that rather than growing like a traditional consulting firm, rather than uh, you know hiring a lot of consultants and then growing our firm, we decided to partner with a senior subject matter experts from boutique consulting firms. Uh, so this model allowed us to grow very quickly. In uh, We started in 2017 and the first three years by 2019, I'm so sorry, I've joined from home. So my birds, every time I speak, they want to speak as well. So sorry about that. I'll try and speak above them. Um, so, uh, you know, by 2019, we already had more than 500 consultants in our ecosystem and we delivered almost 200 consulting projects. Uh, 2020 was supposed to be a great year for us, right? Uh, after the initial growth. Uh, unfortunately, like for most other people, you know, it was supposed to be a great year for everyone. Everyone was so excited, right? The turn of the decade. Uh, unfortunately, things didn't really turn out that way. 2000, uh, after the initial shock in March and April, we decided that with our excess capacity, so we had about 20% excess capacity, we decided that we're going to spend our time on helping the economy get back on track. So away from our core business. Um, so we spent, uh, last year we got about 700 business leaders from all across the GCC to help small businesses and micro businesses grow. This year we decided that why not also start helping larger organizations. Um, so we came up with this idea of Connected Insights. It's a, a web summit, seven days, today's day six. So the second last day where we're getting senior experts like Mads, like Faizan and Fadil to come and share their insights, share their thoughts, et cetera, uh, with us so that we can all learn from each other. Uh, one quick housekeeping point, uh, it's a panel discussion, but feel free at any point, if you'd like to make a comment, ask a question, feel free to use the raise hands feature in Zoom, ask a question on the chat so that uh, Kanika who's facilitating can raise it to the panelists so, uh, and you would have noticed that we've made all of you panelists as well, rather than just attendees, so that you can switch on your videos, ask questions, interact with the panelists as well. Let's make the most out of this la uh, next one uh, or 45 minutes, right? Uh, so that's it from me. I'm really excited to have Mads facilitate this session. Mads is my sales and marketing mentor. So I learned a lot from him and I hope you have a good, um, you have a good session, all of you. Thank you so much, Varun, and I hope that you all hear me now loud and clear. Good morning to all of you. Uh, just before starting up here, we had a short discussion about learning. Uh, and I think uh, this session really shows uh, why it's so interesting. I don't want to go back too long in history, but it's a very interesting point that actually uh, the human spices we see today is not the only Homo sapiens that has arrived on Earth, planet Earth. Going back, there were some of them much bigger than we are, and they were much stronger than we are, but we survived. This species of human, Homo sapiens survived, and this is us here. And there was one main reason that we survived. That was the ability of sharing knowledge and telling stories. And that is also why a panel discussion like this is uh, so interesting. I know that uh, some of you could be competitors. Some of you could actually work together. But one thing is for sure, if we listen and we dare to ask questions today, we have an amazing opportunity to learn. And the reason that this is so important is, I just discussed with, with Faisan and Fadl, our two uh, panel discussion uh, panelists today. And I just discussed with them before that what we have seen over the last maybe five, maybe 10 years, actually sometimes we don't know, is that sales has been under a dramatically changed dramatically changed. And I have to tell you, it's a threat or it could be a reward. It's going to be changing in the future as well. So that's, uh, we can just as well adapt to it and learn from it. And that's also what we're going to discuss today when we're going to discuss how to work with dealers or partners or whatever you call them. There are several names for that. I'll just before uh, letting my, my two uh, panelists uh, uh, introduce themselves. I'll just give you a very short introduction to some figures. And these are very interesting uh, because I am so lucky to work. I hope you see my screen now. Uh, I'm so lucky to work with a lot of uh, scientists from around the world. So I get a lot of knowledge from them. 
Uh, I'm not a scientist myself. I'm a practical salesman as a consultant as well. But there are some interesting figures that can found that make a, a, an interesting foundation uh, for, the, for discussion. First of all, what we see is that 57% actually racing now till about 60% of the buyer journey. That means the time a buyer spent before buying, 60% nearly of that journey they do themselves. They don't interact with anybody. They search the internet, they do things. And that of course changes a lot of things in the sales process that buyers are so informed, they have such a strong power when they approach a salesperson. And if the salesperson approached them at the wrong time, we are wasting time. That's one of the interesting things that has changed over the years. And this figure only goes up and goes up at the moment because self-service even in B2B has become more and more easy. We also see that 60% of sales leaders, they expect the digitization of the sales organization is the most critical thing for their success. Maybe it's not surprising, but that also means that a lot of sales processes, sales organizations, cooperation with dealers, partners, has to change in the way we act and behave. And of course, we all know changes can be difficult. And then the last one, 87% of B2B buyers, they say that they spend significantly less time with salespeople than they used to do. And nobody expects to spend more time. That means the time where the salesman jumped by and drove out to the client, had a cup of coffee, had a discussion, came back a couple of weeks later, they don't have the time and they don't want us to be there if we're not relevant and if we're not arriving at the right time. And with these words, I like to introduce to you the two uh, panelists we have today. And I, I just repeat one thing as Arun said, please, please feel free to ask questions. I will together with Kanika see them and, and try to give them back and raise your hand if you want to ask a question and fee, feel free to participate for the next 45 minutes as much as possible. But Faison, could you start introducing yourself and a little about the challenges you see? Sure, so uh, thank you, Mats. I think you've given a quite interesting figures to start off with. And uh, as you said, see, the, the world that we are right now, it's blurred between physical and virtual space, right? So it's rapidly converging uh, and we see changing patterns and the changing behavior. Uh, buyers definitely, as we see, are more informed. And if we, as salespeople, start addressing the 60%, then we've already lost the interest. So from sales perspective, we, we need to first identify the rest of the 40% that is left. And that 40% needs to be addressed. And uh, buyers more and more right now are, you know, they would expect you to be in person and it could be remote or it could be self-serve. So you need to be prepared for all, you know, one size doesn't fit all. You need to have all levels, whatever is required for that particular instance. So yes, especially this pandemic has accelerated this and uh, we are seeing this challenge in the digitization, but uh, there are ways that it could be addressed, I believe, which definitely we'll be discussing as part of this discussion. Faison, can you put a little word on yourself and your career in sales just shortly? Sure. So uh, I have been with IBM for the last uh, eight plus years now, and the primary focus is around services sales. And uh, when we talk about services sales, it is both direct and through partners. So it is all channel and partner and direct. Perfect, thank you. And then Fadal, I'll pass it over to you and let's hear the points from you. Good morning again. I'll start where Faisan has ended. So uh, I work for HP. I have been with HP for the last uh, 10 years. I moved through uh, different uh, roles and capacities within HP from sales to channel to distribution, then back to uh, back to sales again. And currently I head the sales for the Middle East and Turkey uh, region. I also see uh, a lot of uh, familiar names uh, on the call, which uh, proves to me that we are really, and I IT is really a, a, a community. So uh, welcome all. And I hope that we give you justice with our information 
And please feel free to correct us, direct us, uh, inform us about anything that we may have, uh, have missed. Uh, before going, going forward, I want to touch base to some of the points that uh, Mads has mentioned. Mad was giving some very interesting numbers, 60%, I actually noted them down, 60% of the sales do, them, uh, do, the, do themselves, 60% uh, expect digitization, which reminds me of data, more analytical. I mean, when I, when I heard this from Mads, I couldn't but remember uh, Alvin Toffler. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler, who wrote the Future Shock book, I mean, we joke about it. We say the future shock is not, uh, and is not anymore a future shock. The future shock is the current shock or not even the current shock. The, the current shock is now the current challenge. This, this challenge is happening because of what we call or what he coined as the prosumers. There are no more consumers around us. There are mostly prosumers and we are one of them. Who are prosumers for us to all, to all remember? Prosumers are those consumers who want a say in the design of the product they plan to use. They are so important. We are, think about it for a minute and you will realize that we are all pros, prosumers. A while ago, or maybe a two years ago, the main discussion around in, in, in offices and in strategy meetings was about millennials. Millennials are coming to the workforce and there were actually percentages and, and studies about how many, how many millennials will, will force themselves into the workforce and what would it mean. That discussion is also behind us. We are all that kind of millennial as well. Prosumer came and the term prosumer came and engulfed all of us with the complexity that it brings to our business. Why is it important? Why do I, why, why do I stress on it? Because it, it's our challenge to identify and capture these opportunities of individuality. If a consumer is so advanced in his choices, there are individualities there. The, they demand human-led experiences that will actually define our future tech agenda. These prosumers going forward with all the technological advancements and, and the merge between digital and physical that Faison has touched based on, they give them enormous power that we not only realize data from what they buy, but also from what they reject to buy as well. And, and to answer one of your uh, questions, Mad, about what's my major challenge, I would actually summarize what I said today. We thought it is the industrial revolution. Again, you mentioned scientists, so you're pushing me to mention a lot of names of scientists. That's my passion as well, Mad. I'm not a scientist myself as well. So Klaus Schwab, if you're familiar with Klaus Schwab, the uh, yes. audience, he, he coined as well the industrial revolution. When, when Klaus Schwab came with the Industrial Revolution, the term or the for, or Industry 4.0 term, we all said, okay, that's the challenge we want to go, we want to go after, we want to be careful about. But, but again, while we, while we thought we understood the Industrial Revolution or Industry 4.0, came the pandemic. And while we started to uh, come to terms with the pandemic, came the supply chain disruption. So predicting demand, as a short answer, predicting demand became my main question became my main challenge. I know demand is changing. I know it's coming up and down, but how will, we, how will we know when these changes are happening? How soon we will be able to read the changing? So predicting demand has deemed to be very challenging. And for us to be able to, to manage our business according to that, we need information, we need market intelligence, we need data. Thank you, Fadl. And, uh... Remember, feel free, if you want to ask any question, write them in the chat or raise your hand. Well, where we're going now, I really like your, a lot of your, 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 your quoting the, the people and the, the scientists and the, the writers. That's really interesting. And I want to I wanna give a short perspective on, on dealer sales because we can call it a lot. We can call it dealers or partners or whatever. It's just a sum of people that help us to sell our product to service the market in some ways. And if we look back at this, uh, the good old guy called Ansoff, he uh, developed some uh, matrix to develop strategy in sales. One of them was uh, the expansion matrix that uh, looked upon how can we actually expand our sales. And one of the ways that we could expand could be uh, in ways like franchise, we see it with McDonald's, we can do it in partnership, we saw it with IBM and H HP. And why we do partners is of course, it's in some ways, 
easier than doing it ourselves. We spread easily, but on the other hand, of course, we don't control everything. Then we see that today, uh, I, I'm going to ask you now, Faison and Federal, a question because actually, if we look upon the world today, and so easy it is to contact the consumer and the consumer to contact us, even in B2B. Why do we actually need dealers? Because I see in a lot of businesses, the dealer is some way just an uh, expensive middleman, sometimes delaying something. Uh, and I know in, in this region, in old days, the dealer was a partner creating relationship, promoting your brand, but the world has become so small. So why do we actually need dealers? I know it's a tough question, dealers or partners. Please, you too. Who want to start? Faison? Faison with you. <laughs> if you would like, I, I would definitely. No worries. Uh, see, I, I believe what we are seeing right now as partners, you said, like, why do we need them, right? And then even in this current situation, it I would say it depends a lot on the go-to-market strategy. First of all, on the company, you know, what is their go-to-market strategy? In some cases, I've seen companies who had a different direct strategy, but then they move towards partner-led strategy, even during the current situation, current times. Despite saying, you know, margins are thin and a lot of difficulties in closing the deals, but there are reasons, right? Major reason that I've seen, especially for small startups or small companies in order to grow, right? They need more legs and hands on the ground. What this partner ecosystem provides you is with more people on the ground selling your products or services. But what is very important that, in, in, that I realized over my career, that if they are only box movers or if they are just trying to be a transaction partner, no, then it really won't work. It, there needs to be a certain level of expertise that they need to attach and show their own value, right? Another reason that, that I see right now, uh, in many cases, some partners would have a personal touch of relationship, right? When you're expanding, maybe you don't at that level have that specific level of relationship. You have limited people that you can hire. And as you mentioned, maybe your cost will increase. I believe sometimes having a partner ecosystem it actually reduces your cost because it is the partner who is expanding on your behalf and at the end, you are getting the benefit out of it. So a partner ecosystem definitely, uh, and delay again, as I mentioned, it depends how this partner is handling the whole situation. If it is again, you know, expecting for your response and your, it's being delayed, yes, it will be delayed. But if they have certain protocols, certain SOPs that they need to follow, they, they have a structure that they need to address to the client, or they have a certain pricing understanding, you know, you have given them certain autonomy to a certain extent, they would be very fast in the response, you know. So uh, I, I believe there are challenges at this current time, but what I've seen right now, it really helps. So, so just before handing over to you, Fadl, facing one, uh, one extra question, what I hear you say is that, that the development for the dealer also is very demanding because a transactional dealer, you don't need, uh, but we discussed in a further webinar, we discussed uh, the, the, the topic co-creation or value creation. If they can actually together with you at the consumer create value, then they are, they are valuable. Absolutely. They need to have certain value attached. Just imagine, you know, you have three partners. Oh, at the end, who would customers select? Maybe uh, we do understand pricing is one of the key elements, definitely. But I have seen certain engagements, for instance, security engagements, especially I've seen. Customers would see, you know, who has the service expertise to deliver. Product is being delivered by someone, but they yes. need to see a certain level of service expertise. So they need yeah. to have the right level of expertise to deliver to that customer. Sure. Perfect. Fadul, why do we need uh, dealers? So I think Faizan touched base on the last of the value chain, which is the partners, which are the, delivery, the actual delivery of the products and services. And, th and this is why I will touch base on the further middleman, which is distributor or, a, yes. or the dealer for that. I mean, let, let's not forget why the dealer was initially established, why that concept came. That concept came because of economies or supply chains became much more complex. And hence companies or manufacturers started wanting a, a middleman, 
if I, if I may call it a middleman. We call it sure. distributor, we call it major distributor, we call it uh, uh, major partner, whatever we want to, want to call it. It is because of that complexity. And the main question I will ask, do we still have that complexity or we don't? I think if we answer that question, we will be able to understand if we still need a dealer or not. Step down as well. Today, financial management of the companies is so important. And a dealer plays a big role in the financial strengths plus overall management. I, let me go a bit on, on details in that. It stabilizes credit. Today, if, you, if, if IHP want to work in multi-regions, multi multi-continents, multi-countries, there are a lot of different credit terms that I have to work with. But having, I will only be able to enforce my credit terms with my dealers. So it stabilizes my current, my credit expectations, number one. Number two, you could see what's happening in countries around us from Turkey a few days ago, having its currency devaluate by 15%. If, if that's not all, I don't know, 15% was on Friday. Dealership helps stabilize exchange rates as well because we could agree on what kind of currency we want to work with. These two aspects are extremely important for the financial planning of every manufacturer or every multinational company. Number one. Number two, I spoke before about the industrial revolution, then the pandemic, then the disruptions, and I talked about demand and predicting demand being my major challenge as HP. Having a dealer or a distributor in between could help in managing that due to its stocking capability or stocking facilities as well. If I'm able to manage the stocks better, I'm able to withhold certain demand variations that may happen, that may happen in the market. At the same time, we spoke earlier that everything is getting digitized. Everything is becoming digital. Our consumers are becoming more aware, etc. This Bring, this leads us to require more data. And the, and the middleman is another layer who's exposed to different kinds of data sources due to other products or other engagements that they, that they deal with. So they have more information from the ground, probably stronger relationships and strong relationships with system integrators. So the point here, are our dealers part of our, not just value chain, are our dealers part of our data chain, our data intelligence chain. And if we are able to make them part of our data intelligence chain, then they, they add another importance to their level. Two more points I, I, I will mention here, Localizing of, localizations of experience. I'm a global company. I have global standards, global way of looking at things. I need localizations of experiences, whether in terms of contract terms, Will I be able to contract as an American company, as an HP, as an IBM? Will I be able to contract directly with companies with, which have, for example, Islamic laws? Will I be able to abide by these laws? Will I be able to abide by, by their credit terms, by their legal terms? I don't think I can. Can I enforce my terms? I don't think I can, but I can enforce my terms on my dealer who in turn enforces his terms into the market. So stabilization of financial planning, standardization, of the contractual terms that we can uh, work with. Last point is I produce HP products. Fizan produces IBM products and services. What we need somebody, our consumer is much more advanced, much more complicated. We need somebody in between who could complete our offering as well, who could bring in sometimes competing products, but that could fit well into our overall experience of the client. But not only that, maybe, maybe it will help me upsell or it will help me complete the end user experience. I really like your point here because uh, what we talk about here is that we are not only talking about a transactional a simple system. We are talking about, as you said, Fesson, and you really said as well, Fadl, we're talking about not only a, a, a supplier deliver system, we're talking about an ecosystem. We're talking about a data system. We're talking about co-creation together. Uh, and that means sometimes, as you said, Fettel, uh, we will compete. We are competitors, but we actually deliver together. And that is, uh, that is created by a, a strong partner that can do this. That's interesting. And then you said one more thing. I was uh, once participating in a, a huge uh, board uh, member seminar, and we talked a lot about uh, data. And uh, people seem to be so scared about data and people getting in touch with our data. 
The funny thing is right now, we see that having data about health actually helps us to improve everything. So you're talking right, Fadl, here. We need to gather all these information and data because they can help us to be more efficient, more secure, more safe, more, uh, in the, uh, more quality wise. So I really like your, your point. And then I, I would like to address, because I see also that you, there's the old value chain changes sometimes because uh, in old days, we wanted a distributor. Today, we want somebody to create solutions. To, today, we want somebody to work together with and maybe we manufacture the product, but we want to be closer with them. So dealers, partners, whatever we call them, distributors, they are also under a huge, tremendous pressure. Markets are getting lower. Price pressure is there. Competition getting more bigger in the world. How do we actually develop strong correlation and strong uh, working together, co-creation with a dealer or partner? What does it demand from, from uh, guys like you and your companies? So, uh, see, what I've seen so far, you know, you cannot just have a partner and just expect him to do everything. In the current situation, especially, you need to train your partners to address the situation at hand. They need to be, uh, if they are services partner, it requires maybe some very enhanced trainings because that's very personal touch that is there. In terms of product, obviously, they need to know certain qualitative factors uh, that is there. Even now, that sales leader, how, how they are working, uh, if you see, and, and Father already pointed out on the data structure, this data is coming from the tools that is being implemented, right? So it is very important that tools are implemented and connected with the partner ecosystem so that they are gathered and, and, and as salespeople, we need to look at the holistic picture. We need to look at our own data statistics. We need to look at the partner statistics. And accordingly, we have to make a decision what we have to do. But essentially at the heart of it requires a hardcore training that needs to go into the whole ecosystem. And then there would be certain tiering system that normally we would have. Certain would be value added distributors. So it, it all depends on what level of uh, partnership these uh, dealers or partners that you call are. Tier one, tier two, tier three, all depending how they have developed their skill set in terms of training. But Faison, it must sometimes be difficult because I know uh, if you look at the, the old time uh, partner, uh, some of them really enjoyed working together with IBM. But on the other hand, they also said, face and stay away. I have my own business. Uh, I run my business. So don't come too close. Uh, will, will you put it a little on, on, on the tough side? Will you be able to work together today with dealers or partners that don't want to, to really interact with you? See, uh, Part they, you would find partners, you know, uh, where you will have difficulties because sometimes partner becomes, you know, dominant in certain aspects. Yeah. They get more power. Yeah. Uh, if you talk about large SIs, they were dealing into very large deals in which you might have a small components. So you need to be as close to the consumer as you are and as close to the partner at the same time. You cannot leave either of them. No. Both needs to be addressed and needs to identify what really creates value for them. It is not only that partners create value for you, but you need to create some value for the partner as well. In Definitely. case of SIs, SI for example, you know, as I mentioned, they might be a small piece, but that piece for you is very important. And maybe for the partner, who it might not be that relevant and he can get it from another, another vendor. Yeah. So how you attach your product or services to that engagement is very critical. So. At that point, I would say, you know, the trust and the level of engagement that you're having with that partner really counts. And yeah. connection is the new currency, right? In the yes. current scenario. So we need to have the right currency with us to create this whole system. And I think uh, when, when you mentioned this, it's not only a matter of what kind of product and what kind of uh, price schedule you can give. It's also a matter of what value you can create for that dealer, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. As I said, you know, it's not only a partner creating value for you. But you need to see how you create value for that partner. Yes, perfect. Fadl, what do you? What is your point here? How do we? How can we actually uh, uh, help the, the, the dealer? And how do we do the strategy for for the dealers? Great. So, and Matt, there's also a question from Yunus Shah after Fadl finishes. Okay. After Fadl finishes. So, 
imagine if we are today talking about the existence or non-existence of dealership, imagine what they are talking about. This has been a discussion that is keeping them out of sleep since a very long time. Yeah. And I've been engaged in several of these discussions with dealerships in across the region. There was a common consensus that every distributor who comes and asks, how can I be relevant for the future? And today I move boxes. I, I borrow what Faisan said at the beginning. I move boxes. Today I'm just part of your overall supply chain. How can I become part of your overall value chain? How can I deliver a value? And they even started producing terms for it. They even said uh, they wanted to move from a distributor to value added distributor. They started giving abbreviations and names to all the different. That's what we do, right? Uh, Homo sapiens, in addition to what you said about Homo sapiens, we create terms and abbrevi abbreviations for everything around us. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So, value added distributor. And, and there was a consensus that. In order for, for a distributor to be valid for the future, that distributor needs to sell services. Yes. And that's the, what kind of services, nobody knew, but I need to sell services. I need to s attach some kind of a service to whatever I sell, and this is how I'm gonna be uh, relevant for the future. I personally was always against that, uh, that notion. If services is not your area, services should not be your future go-to, uh, go uh, in all fairness. But, uh, but traditionally, the way companies like HP and others were working with, with distributions, whether training them or incentivizing them, has to change in order for us to support them to grow and become that more valuable in, throughout the value chain. And previously, we were always and companies, I, I use we, but I mean industry, I don't mean HP. No, no. Uh, we as the industry used to only, only incentivize dealership based on performance. So yes. are you performing or are you not performing? And yeah. are you performing in this particular time frame, which is a month, a quarter, a week, a year, or whatever, however I my KPIs are, or are you not? And this is extremely wrong because this removes the future aspect yes. of the discussion and of the business health of the manufacturer, multinational manufacturer and the dealer itself. And today we have to incentivize based on their transformational readiness, mm -hmm. not just performance KPIs. And what do I mean by transformational readiness? Transformational readiness, obviously in addition to sales, sales and numbers are still very important. We have to incentivize them about performance. I just say performance so that we don't forget that it's still important, about their capability and about their collaboration. Their capability is more like readiness for the future. The collaboration is, is, is more about data. So we have to go deeper into their organization, not just performance data. We have to go deeper into the organization, help them train them. If we are going into a, a, into a transformation, we have to pull them up into a transformation as well. We have to make them realize, whether by training them or their salespeople or whatever, make, make them realize that data is the new norm, that mm -hmm. they need to collaborate, and this is how they need to collaborate. We need to go deeper into their organization, and also probably when I invest in them in the future, I will not invest in them to only create more, uh, hire more salespeople. Maybe I will invest in, I, I invest in them to make system integration and to develop their systems and tools or their online presence. And this is how I develop. This is how I will be able to help my yes. distributor prepare for the future. But that also calls for them understanding the importance of this because as you said, performance, of course it's important with performance, but performance comes from something from the past because it comes from activities you've done a year, years ago or a month ago. But what you talk about here is the transformation to understand what it takes to bring performance in the future. Uh, and that's, that's really interesting. Uh, Varun, you said we had a question. Uh, I cannot see any questions anywhere. So please uh, help me here. Mm, there's a question from Eunice. Uh, Eunice, would you okay, like to Eunice? unmute and ask? Please. Yes, hi. Uh, hi am Eunice. I audible? Yes, you are. We hear you clearly. Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, 
this session. So thank you for that. I have two questions. One is, uh, okay, I'll, I'll introduce myself briefly. Uh, so I work for Clean Box Technology. Uh, we are a national uh, USA-based uh, company manufacture uh, smart tech hygiene devices uh, using UVC technology. So the devices are for the decontamination of you know, frequently used products. So it could be anything from, from headsets to virtual reality headsets to, to, uh, to TV remotes or tablets. Uh, so these are, we, are, we manufacture the devices to de disinfect, uh, you know, all these uh, devices. So the first question is, Mads, to you. Um, I saw <clears throat> in your presentation, the brief presentation, the last slide, I believe it said that 87% uh, uh, of the B2B clients do not want to speak to salespeople. Is that uh, what you mentioned? So what's the reason? Um, because I manage business for the MENA region and I speak to a lot of people. Um, so it's, uh, you know, this is very interesting stats that you mentioned. So I would like to know what's the reason and why they don't want to uh, speak. The other question is to both uh, Fezan uh, and uh, Fadil. Um, um, the, the great points you you guys have mentioned. Uh, it's been a great learning for me for, for the last 20, 20 five minutes. Uh, the question is with regards to uh, you know the dealership strategy. Uh, what do you think is the best practice uh, strategy? I mean, it could vary. I understand vary from product to product. But from a B two B product, because uh, uh, you know B two C product, yes, there is probably more catch for the retailers and for the dealers because uh, the 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 uh, uh, because of the profit margin and because there is a lot more opportunity uh, because the consumer base is more than compared to B two B. So, what is the best practice strategy? Uh, is it the pricing? Is it uh, you know, um, Fadil mentioned about transformational readiness, uh, you know, incentivize them, or is it, uh, is it the, you know, the training? So uh, it would, I would appreciate if, uh, you know, I get a feedback and your thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you, Yunus. And I, I think I'll address the question to Faison and Fadil first, and then I'll come back to the other one. I hope that's okay, Yunus. Uh, so Faison and Fadil, please, the question from Yunus. Uh, thank you, Yunus. Uh, uh, as I understand your question, like how, what could be the best leadership strategy, right? So in the start, I mentioned like uh, it's difficult to find a one size fits all solution. But overall, if, if I look at it, see with, with the digitization, how it is happening and how data is becoming more and more important, you need, we all need to understand how omni channel is working. The presence of having us uh, as a business with our customers everywhere and whenever they need and how they need is very important. For example, like I was reading certain stats from McKinsey reports uh, and it defines you know, how the whole cycle works for uh, in the age of digitization. Well, they mentioned that, uh, that you have first the identification process where you identify uh, the suppliers or the vendors then you evaluate them, right? And then you select and order them and then you reorder them. So I'm sure in, in your journey, as you would see, all these would be present. And what they have mentioned that over compared to last year, the statistics have increased as people are moving more toward digitization. And, and what they were pointing out that, for example, even the sales serve, for instance, reordering, like in, in the start, we, we had a friend who mentioned about uh, Xerox and he mentioned about, you know, the supplies. So just imagine if the buyer is having the control, you need to give some level of control to them. For example, in the sales serve portal, creating a portal where they can reorder, especially in the reordering part, the statistics has increased dramatically as McKinsey mentioned, because people just want to click on the button, even in B2B sales, and they would just get the order done. It's already agreed with them. So they, they don't want to reconnect and go through the whole cycle again. So, so the, the strategy, I would say it, it's a mix, you know, you need to understand how your channels are developed and uh, especially with regards to data, how 
connected your ecosystem in terms of data is data is, is very important and I, I cannot stress it more and father stress it in, in many occasions once you have the clarity of data at each point your internal organization and that is connected with partner that will really help you in maybe defining the right strategy so i would suggest gather as much data as possible and analyze sit with with the experts to see how you can really uh, define that strategy it could be multiple strategy it cannot be one strategy or a one strategy but that needs to be based on certain data that you would be able to gather perfect fazan uh, parl uh unis for before i answer i just want to ask you do you are you working in a two tier strategy which is basically you sell to a distributor who sells to a partner who sells to a customer or are you selling to a partner who is the same time a distributor and you sell to a customer yeah thank you very much so it's basically we work with i mean we do uh direct sales and then we have uh, resellers all right uh, but so, it's 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 that yeah that's how uh, we manage currently so one step before the end user in this case and potentially as well direct business and your question is yes. more about that kind of a channel partner how can i probably make him work better with me so yeah and considering that you know the b2b uh, dealership especially for uh, you know our product line is is very limited i mean but from 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 what you said I, i don't know if you can still hear me you and uh, a lot of knowledge yeah from from what you said you know your the attention that the channel gives your product is not directly proportional to to your portion of their overall revenue and that's a that's a very dangerous news to be very honest what do i mean by that if you are 1% of their overall revenue don't expect that they're going to give you 1% attention why is this important because this the choice of your partner is very important if you are probably 10% of their overall revenue maybe you will get the, the, their 5% attention so so look into don't, don't just look which partner is organically more viable to sell my product look at their overall financials at their overall turnaround at their, at their at their overall revenues in a year and then decide is this the partner that i want to plug my products with and what would my product be in over in their overall revenue because even if your product really makes sense to them and it can organically complete their portfolio it may just be a logo in their on their website that they just advertise just to show that they have a complete ecosystem there so i i i invite you to look at that aspect and once once you do you're going to maybe in in many cases as at least in my case i found myself that the we changed the complete partner landscape thank you fadel and i'll just comment on that before coming under under the percentage i think what uh, what you two guys just mentioned here is very valuable i think uh, <clears throat> from my perspective i will give you a a very short uh, uh, three step model so to speak to 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 define this first of all i want you to answer a question you probably you heard about simon senek and you also he always tells it starts with a why and i will ask you yonas the question why do you want resellers or partners or dealers because the why you should ask is why do you want it for yourself and why do you want it for them that means what's in it for you and for them if there's nothing in it for you or for them then go away as fatal said and then secondly why not why shouldn't you have dealers because there's always an upside and a downside and and what i hear very often is that smaller companies they want resellers to they think they can just expand the sales very fast but sometimes it actually hurt the brand or or hurt the something else so really ask yourself the question why what can i do for them and what can they do for me and then i will have the second part what kind of dealer is the right dealer for me what is the characteristics what should the, what is their behavior what how what do they look like because if you pick the wrong ones it's not very good and then you can start defining how to do that means how to work together how to get the data how to do everything but you need to understand 
Dealers are not always the right solution. Sometimes it's a good solution, but ask that question to yourself. Uh, does it make sense, Jonas? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, and then a comment on the 87%, because the minute I heard these figures, I was a little shocked. And there are reasons for this. Uh, it doesn't mean that people don't want to see salesperson. It doesn't mean that they don't want to engage with your company digital or self-service wise, but there was a main reason behind it. And there's three things coming here. First of all, that the, the main thing, if I should interact with a sales guy or salesperson, he or she must be relevant. That means they must understand my business. If they don't understand my business, please stay away. And research showed that a lot of people doing the purchasing found that a lot of salespeople just came to present products. They came to present their company and they don't want to spend time on that because they can do that on the internet. So relevance here is understand my business. The second one is to be valuable. That means if a sales guy wants to approach a customer, he needs to create value, not for himself, but for the corporation, for the client. So the, the two first was relevance, the second was valuable, and the third one was timing. Try to imagine, Jonas, that I call you today and I want to sell you something that you don't need. That means I, I call you and Jonas, I don't know where you live, but try to imagine that a real estate agent called you today to sell you an apartment and you just decided to move into a townhouse. I'm, I'm totally irrelevant. I'm not creating value and timing is wrong. But if I was so lucky that I called you with a townhouse one month before you were looking for that or when you were looking, then I was relevant and timing was right. So the reason that B2B purchasers don't want to spend time is they find a lot of salespeople irrelevant, bad timing, and not valuable. Does it make sense, Jonas? Yes, thank you. Thank you for and that. Matt, if you allow me to comment, Matt, if you allow me to comment sure. as well, I, I, I really like what you have mentioned, especially the uh, reference to Simon Sinek as well. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add that a lot of salespeople have become vanilla. It is so expected what they are going to come and do and say. And let me give another example because I like the example of the townhouse and real estate. When we, when we do interviews of people, people in their profiling as well, which is the most probably the more important presentation that they provide, that they do more important than when they present a product. It's so vanilla that I even sometimes tell the people that I interview, you know what? I am going to know, I know all the questions, obviously, because I'm going to ask them, but I also know all the answers because I can Google them. So, the, so, and this is the reason why our customers have been less excited, interested to see our salespeople because it's all vanilla. It's the same corporate presentation. They start with the same uh, pre uh, slide and they end with the same slide and they give you a rundown. They are feature creatures. Mm. They are feature creatures. They give you a rundown about the features of whatever they're going to come. And it's so vanilla. So a salesperson has to come and do something new, do something relevant, do something that he believes. And it's a, it's a wild guess in many cases, but it's a lot of preparation in, if, if you want to do it right. They have to go and try to be relevant and give information, not like any other salespeople would, salesperson would do. I think that's really interesting. What we, what we see today is, uh, and again, uh, a lot of behavioral researchers, they found out what we see, there is a change because if we go to the old days, old days, not that far away, uh, when we were looking for a sales guy, we looked for somebody who was very extrovert and very engaged and dynamic. What we see today is we're not looking for an introvert, but a little more introvert and somebody who's more analytic and a little more rational, uh, being able to handle data, like you said, Faison. And that means, as you said, Paddle, they need to be not so vanilla. They need to be understanding it's totally different ball game they're playing. And just Faison, imagine you know how complicated uh, it has become with the, the current situation where you're not yes. actually going and presenting, where the video is switched off and you're just keep saying, you know, and, and uh, I have heard like some of the friends at the customer side 
that we are not actually listening because the guy is just going on and on and on so that that's a really important skills that i believe we as sales leader needs to inculcate in our sales team so that they are able to present in the right way and it's not what you're presenting it's the questions that you're asking i, I often say yeah. you know especially yeah. when the first engagement is happening you know and you just go and start you need to create that environment and especially a discussion mode right in in the current scenario especially if you go and present hardly you would expect people listening let me yeah. tell you something that next time it will make you laugh next time you pre- attend a presentation and or next time you go with somebody who presents just to show you how vanilla everybody how programmed everybody is so they go into a meeting room they chit chat about the weather about anything else about the pandemic vaccines whatever for 15 minutes and then after that 15 minutes start, uh, finishes they open the presentation and say good morning everybody today i'm going to start with my presentation <laughs> very true very true <laughs> exactly they start with themselves right you told you because right. they're used to say good morning at the beginning of the presentation even if they have spent 15 minutes talking to each other they have to say good morning before they yeah. present <laughs> you're right <laughs> And that's the time a customer starts doing something else. <laughs> yes. We uh, we got a question in the chat. It's a long question. Uh, Karishma, you want to to present the question yourself because it's a very long comment and a great question. Uh, so please uh, if you're there, Karishma. Yes. Um hi everyone. Um Hello. Karishma here. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for the session. Uh, my question is so um you know as we've been discussing how do you create value for your partners? and uh, you know we're managing sales for distributors uh, as you may call it so sharing data here is key say with regards to customers needs etc right so that will basically like benefit the entire sales network so since customers needs are important too obviously you know because um it's quite expanded like people are finding out different ways to or maybe say the way consumers shop is becoming more diverse so my question is like do companies like say hp or ibm for example they rely on data provided by partners or they take on strategies as well um into consideration to like find out customers needs directly as well because what i believe is you know disregarding the um, customers needs would probably just open doors to like say other competitors as well the last sentence please last sentence what was it because what i believe is if you disregard your customers needs it would just open doors to other competitors So do you rely on data sources provided by your partners or do you also directly have strategies in place to know what your customers needs are because you know we've been talking more about creating value for your partners but what about your customers as well Okay Jason Fettel who is that I I can take that Yeah yes. So Sorry I got I got a little bit interrupted but let me repeat what I, what, what probably i have the question so the question is do we rely do we rely on data from our partners and customers to take to take to take decisions so first yes very much we have an omni channel way into collecting data as hp and hp is going into a major transformation in terms of uh, data collection for sure but let me tell you one thing a partner who does not collaborate and collaboration means data a partner who does not collaborate is not a partner is not a partner anymore is not an hp partner anymore so so today mad said that a sales person has to be analytical and it's correct the whole organization has to be very analytical and to be analytical we need data and a lot of data and tools and systems and people who know how to deal with this data so not only we rely on data from customers partners all kinds of channels that we have we as well are looking into our people developing our people to be more analytical it's it's it is changing our partner acquisition strategy dealer acquisition strategy talent acquisition strategy as well inside yeah and i'll just add you know like uh, this is regards to partner you also mentioned around customers so yes we do have the same systems in place and uh, especially you know from the internally i would say the marketing department has, is collecting a lot of data that is helping us about the customers so it is a mix of partner marketing internal that we all collaboratively try to sit and work out what is important for us so yes data from all aspect is important in the current scenario okay yeah, thank you thank okay. you so much and then we got a question um, 
uh, if my partner is approached, pro approached by my competitor, what strategy uh, in benefit-based marketing helps me to get edge over my competitor? So you see the point. Also, your partners can be approached. That means an IBM partner could be approached by HP or differently. Uh, what what uh, strategy uh, will help me here? Oh, yeah. go ahead, please. No, no, no go ahead. You, you. So, al allow me to ask a different uh, question. Is your partner landscape, in terms of breadth, in terms of number, size, correct? Because some, if it is big enough, if it's bigger than what it should be, that thing is always going to happen. If it is too small, it's a different problem to your, to your growth. So first I would ask, is my partner landscape right for me? And right, before you answer that question, right, and not, not just in terms of their capabilities and collaboration with you, right in terms of your relevance to them from... I'm going to repeat myself here. What is your share of business to them compared to overall business that they do? Number one. Number two, what can, what can they do without your product? And these questions will lead you to choose the right partner landscape. And if you have the right partner landscape, believe me, you're going to have less competition interaction uh, with you in that uh, uh, competition at attacking your channel partners in that case. But if it happens... If it happens, it, it, and assuming that you have the right channel partners, the right breadth, the right uh, depth with your channel partners, and the right relevance with your channel partners, and if it happens, it's actually one of the most interesting discussions I would have with a partner. I would understand what's happening, and I would cut it immediately. I would either decide to fight, and because there's a reason why my partner would entertain such a discussion. I would immediately discuss, acknowledge my failure and walk away immediately from that partnership, not try to save him at all. Or I will actually go and understand the problem. Maybe it's something that I have totally missed out and I will work on it and, 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 uh, and fix. It raises a question as well that when you work with partners only for their profit or, or when your partners work with you only for their profit margins on your product, that's something is going to is deemed to happen regularly every time a new competitor comes they're going to talk to your talk to your channel partners so make sure that your relationship with your partner is beyond the profit just the profit margins or the uplift percentages that they do i'll just add one one comment to that because uh, badal has addressed comprehensively i'll just take one step ahead you know i'll be close to my customer as well i'll make sure that i am close to the customer and addressing his needs and customer understands why he needs me so that when I am interacting with the partner, I have control. I know what I'm discussing. Otherwise, if you give all the control, then it's difficult. You need to have control at some level. That's very important. But as rightly pointed out, you need to select the right partner. That's very important. You cannot waste your time. It's very important. You need Mr. Kani, was the uh, answer OK? OK. I just have yes. one comment there, and then I think we have to final, finalize this final discussion. First of all, uh, this is a very relevant question because um, I think we have to learn in sales that we actually don't, we don't own that much. That means I often hear somebody who wants to fence their clients. They want to fence the partnerships. But uh, I could ask you, how many of us want to be put in behind a fence? That means we have to create also, as you said, Faison, we have to create... Uh, that we are actually uh, we are valuable as as a, a working together with the partner. And that if that happens and we are not creating value for the partner, unless the partner is is not is cheating us, then we have to expect that they will be opposed uh, that, that by that. And that my ending question here, just to Fadel and, and Faison, very short answer because we have to finish now. Fadel and Faison, your best advice to somebody who wants to work with dealer, what will that be? I would say, don't just look at how your company is doing with or through that dealer. Look, look how the dealer is doing in general. I like that. And Thank you. Faison? Uh, be as close as possible to the partner. Work on the omni-channel strategy. That's very important with the Amazing. partners to collect the data.
And with these words, I really want to thank you, Fadel and Faison, for coming here. I want to thank all your participants for being here. Questions from some of you were amazing. Faison and Fadel, have an amazing day out there. Thank you for bringing this knowledge to the table. And I hope you really enjoyed this uh, session. Thank you so much, everybody. And Fadel and Faison, thank you for your time. Take care, thank all you of so you, much. and, and stay care. safe. Bye-bye.